I was a ranger, a climbing ranger, at the Allegheny State Park in New York from 2003 to 2008. This park is well known for its free-roaming bison herd and the number of also unsolved murders that occurred there the past 150 years or so. During the 4th of July weekend in 27, I had an experience that I just could not explain. I was assigned to the eastern side of the park to staff the entrance booth and hiking trails. In the other side of Route 98 from the main campground, there was also a designated picnic area that was quite further back in the woods. I drove into the park and parked my Hummer in the parking lot behind the picnic area. After sitting in the vehicle for a few moments, then got out to open the gate that leads to the picnic area. As I was walking back out to my vehicle, I noticed a family of four sitting at the table. They were in the process of unpacking their food. I greeted them kindly, opened the gate, and drove up to the booth. I was expecting that I would be the only ranger on duty for the rest of the weekend. I was wrong. I was actually the third ranger assigned there. I arrived a little bit before noon, and one ranger had just left. It was a beautiful day and people were out in droves. I had quite a bit of traffic. At one point, I was helping three separate groups of people, all with their own issues of some kind. There was a delay in water supply, apparently, so I was calling utility companies to try and fix them. I also had to give two people different directions since they weren't sure where to go. I'm not sure how long I'd been occupied with these tasks, but I was beginning to notice it was getting a little darker than usual. Earlier, the daylight savings time change had just occurred, and I was getting ready to check the woods on the other side of the picnic area. Then I noticed a car coming down the side of the road. The road was a secondary access and led to a small picnic area and the Alcane Cemetery, which is quite old. I was surprised to see the car come out of nowhere, so I got back behind the booth and watched it drive up to the area and stop. I was puzzled because I thought the area was closed. The driver and the passenger got out, looked around, and got back into the vehicle very suspiciously. They drove out of the area and out of sight. I immediately went to the booth and found the key to the radio and carried it with us. I called the on-call ranger and told them about the incident, and the two seemed very sketchy, like they were looking for something. I also told them about the other rangers assigned to the area. He said there was nothing he could do until their shift ended at around 8 p.m. I watched the road for a little while longer and noticed the light was now getting dimmer. I decided to check out the woods to the west of the picnic area. The area was quite hard to access and required some bushwhacking. As I walked along the natural trail, I noticed that most light was gone. I stopped and looked around. I noticed it had now become very quiet, just about no sounds whatsoever. I began to walk more quickly. I had a bad feeling about being out there alone. As I was making my way along the trail, I heard something walking towards me. I stopped and listened. I swear that I could hear breathing. I was scared but somehow managed to get out my flashlight and turn it on. The beam of light illuminated the area in front of me, and I finally saw what was standing about 15 feet in front of me. The thing was 7 to 8 feet tall, made from a combination of ferns and skin. It looked like a mixture of bear and a human. I raised the radio to my mouth to call the on-call ranger again, but it let out the most terrifying growl that I've ever heard. It raised its right arm and lunged at me, but I turned and ran as fast as I could down the trail. I knew that I only had about a quarter mile to go before I would reach the open meadow area. I was trying my hardest not to look back, but I did so and saw that the thing was keeping up with me with ease. I kept telling myself that it was just an animal, and there was nothing supernatural about it, but that did not work. As I reached the open meadow, I tripped on a fallen log and went down. I was trying to get up and run when I heard it coming. A shot rang out, and I could hear the cracking of twigs and branches. Then the on-call ranger appeared and told me to stay down. The thing was circling us, but it would not approach any closer. The ranger fired two more shots. We could hear the thing running away. He helped me up and walked me back to the booth. I injured my knee during the fall, but did not want to seek any medical help. 
We had a mutual agreement together to keep quiet about this and to not tell our supervisors or anybody else. We know we have no idea what kind of professional retribution there would be or potentially career kill. Since all this, I've moved to Georgia and I now work for a private security firm. I still do a lot of hiking and camping, but never really go off trail if I can help it. Thanks for your time. In December 1986, I was serving in a battalion of the of the Italian army in Bolzano. As I usually did in my off-duty time, I was strolling through the city which at that moment was beautiful to visit and see. It was nighttime and Christmas time and the buildings were festooned and decorated. The city itself was full of life with many people around for shopping at a given moment. I had the impression you feel when someone is staring at you. I turned my eyes and looked, and in that moment my blood turned to ice. This thing, from only about a meter or so away, was watching me. I could hear it breathing. Its eyes, which were cold and blue, were burning inside me as if he was browsing through my soul. It lasted maybe a second more likely, even less than the blink of an eye, and it turned into a rather attractive forty-something-year-old woman wearing a fur coat. The scariest thing was she was smiling at me with ice-cold blue eyes. I got away as fast as possible and didn't turn back. This was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. The eyes of that thing were the same color blue as the eyes of the woman, very light blue. The place was full of people, yet no one showed any signs that they noticed anything but me. I never mentioned this incident to anyone for years, just buried it. The first person I mentioned it to was my fiancé. This is not a joke and I don't do any drugs. When I turned around the beast was sitting on a park bench. I'm 6'4'3 and this thing looked bigger than me, but the woman appeared to be of normal height 5 foot something. She had shoulder length dark blonde hair, the same color as the beast. I'm no wimp, I can tell you that much, but I almost crapped myself. I could see the muscles of the creature underneath the blonde hair. It was slowly gathering itself up beneath itself like it was preparing to jump down my throat. Solid muscles, veins, tendons, I could see it all. I knew that it was real, believe it or not. I'm still too scared to think about it after all these years, and the scariest part was the woman wanted me to get closer. As I said, I buried this memory for years surfaced with my fiancé, who also had some weird paranormal experiences, asked me if I could believe that she sees such things. I thought it was a demon not hunting for flesh, but rather for souls if that word makes sense to you. I'm not religious, but I know that thing was evil. I felt that much the beast was the scariest thing I ever saw, but the woman was somehow scarier with her bedroom eyes, that come hither smile like a scene straight out of the twilight zone or something and what creeped me out most was that she evidently was showing herself only to me on a busy downtown street and no one else. Thanks for letting me get this off my chest. It's been bothering me for 40 years. Hope it helps someone. Years ago, I had an experience that could have been straight out of an X-Files episode. I used to visit this younger woman at her apartment, who I tutored her in math because I needed the money. We didn't have a relationship or anything like that, but she would stare at me while I talked. Like she wanted to make eye contact rather than look at the formulas. I brushed it off as an attempt at unserious fling from her end, because at the same time she talked about the man in her life who lived abroad. She had told me she was 20 years old and looked the part and went to college, but she would most strangely talk like she had been born 100 years ago or more. But now and here is the weird part. The following was what happened the last day I went to her apartment. I came to her apartment at 2 p.m., as I used to. She opened, and she dressed all in a black tight tracksuit. During the following two hours, her face would become more and more red. While I explained math to her, it was like she was sick or something would try to lock her eyes with mine forcibly. When it came time to leave, then it was the paranormal stuff happened. We were in the hall of her apartment when she suddenly stopped talking while she was in front of her door, and it was like the size of her eyes changed. Plus, it was like she was trying to hypnotize me. 
and her eyes became almost vampire animal-like. Believe it or not, but it was like her face almost changed for seconds, and a grin appeared like it was a demon I was standing in front of. I remember saying I wanted to get out, and after saying it three times, she snapped out of it and came back. I was able to get her to move from the door, and I was able to leave. Some would say who don't believe in the paranormal. They say it was just a weird attempt of sex, and maybe it was. But still to this day, to quote the American lady in the plane video, that mother F wasn't really human. Has anyone here ever experienced something similar? Hello. This incident took place in October 2021 in Rochdale in Greater Manchester, UK. I lived alone after breaking up with my ex. I spent most of my time in the evenings upstairs playing video games and watching YouTube videos. I didn't really have much of a social life, but that was okay with me. I'd never felt uneasy in my own house until the time when this incident took place. I would walk into the kitchen at night to make a drink. My kitchen window looks out at my overgrown garden which in turn overlooked the woods. It's a rural neighborhood and it is very quiet at night which makes it a friendly environment for some wildlife to come out. I would often see foxes and deer. At night when the lights are on I can barely see more than a few feet ahead of the window as it acts sort of like a mirror. On this particular night, the few feet ahead of me that I could see was all this thing needed to make itself visible to me. I hadn't noticed it until I looked up and out of the window after making my drink. It was a bipedal creature, skinny but quite tall with hind legs and no hair. It sounds ridiculous to mention this, but it looked similar to the werewolf lupine transformed into the Prisoner of Azkaban movie, only taller and more humanoid. Its mouth was tiny but protruded, similar to a canine's. It had no ears from what I could see. It just stood there looking at me with these completely white tiny eyes. Its head was tilted to the side and its bottom jaw was slightly gaped. I didn't know how long it had been there. I was in the kitchen for about a minute before I even bothered to look out the window. I just froze. You'd think you can rationalize what you do in a situation like this, but I was frozen in terror. I was thinking myself to move, but my body felt icy cold. After like 15 seconds, even though it felt much longer, I managed to move and ran out of the room, not daring to take my eyes off the creature. As I did so its head rotated to follow me as I ran to the comforts of the upstairs. After all this time, I still have not gone into my kitchen at night, except for a few necessary occasions. I prepare everything I need before it gets dark, and then stay upstairs for the rest of the night. If I absolutely need to go into the kitchen, I'll rush in so that I can get out a SAP. You know that feeling you get when you turn all the lights off before you have to go back upstairs and feel like you're going to be chased by some unknown entity. That's the feeling I get when I need to go into my kitchen at night. To this day, I know instinctively that the werewolf creature is still watching me. My current boyfriend believes I'm imagining the beast, but he won't go out at night when he visits. I have asked people who I trust to offer their opinions about this creature, but I know that none of them really believe me. I have considered moving, but I love this house. After my father's passing on August 8th, an inexplicable occurrence transpired last night. I penned the following account immediately at around 5 a.m., with minor revisions to address punctuation and grammatical errors. I had dozed off on my mother's living room couch, the TV droning on. I had tucked my phone beneath my pillow, resting under my head. Roughly an hour seemed to have elapsed when I sensed my phone vibrating, as if a call was incoming. I groggily glanced at the screen, and Peanut was the caller. With a drowsy, hello, I answered. A voice came through, laden with static but unmistakably my father's, exclaiming his signature, hey in a tone of slight amazement, as if surprised it had worked. Overwhelmed, I muttered, Oh my God, hey. He explained that his phone was malfunctioning or unresponsive, leading him to dial from Peanut's phone. He shared, I've been trying to call everyone. I just wanted to tell you I love you and I'm safe. 
He continued, mentioning a room number, four. The digits were three and initiated with a four. I reciprocated the sentiment, expressing my love and relief at his safety. I requested him to repeat the room number due to the static and the TV's blaring volume. He echoed the, I love you and I'm safe, followed by the room number, which once again got muffled by interference and the TV's clamor. Concluding with an, I love you too, dad, I don't recall the call's conclusion, but I woke up in the exact environment from my dream, bewildered by the events. A few additional details. His voice carried a semblance of his sickly tone, though improved. The TV program was family feud prior to my slumber, transitioning into an infomercial, persisting into my dream, and resuming upon my awakening. The identity of Peanut remains a mystery within my family circle. So, I had something happen to me today while at the grocery store. But first, a little backstory on me so the situation will make more sense. I am middle-aged and was diagnosed with a DHD, spectrum of autism, anxiety, and mild depression. One of my biggest challenges in life is the ability to focus, obviously. I am oblivious to minor things around me and never pay attention to those things. Just going to pick up a few things gives me massive anxiety and find that wearing my AirPods helps tremendously. Well, today I was on my way home to get ready for work and needed a few things from the store. My spouse has a standing rule that I text him before I go to see if he needs anything, so I did. He needed two fillets of salmon at two pounds each and two cans of chickpeas, the cheapest ones. So I grab what I need first and make my way to pick up his stuff. Got the salmon and headed to the canned aisle. As I walk down the aisle, I see an older gentleman walking towards me. I spent eight years in the army, so I did what came natural and stepped to the side with my back to the shelf. This is where it gets weird. As he walked by me, he raises his hand and points directly at the chickpeas, which just so happened to be the cheapest on sale for five dollars. This wasn't a hand wave made in jest. This was a direct and intentional point to the chickpeas. I stood frozen for about a minute trying to grasp what had just happened. I came very close to asking him why he pointed, but by the time I snapped out of it, he was gone. Now, there might be a reasonable explanation for this and kinda hope there is. Why else would he point at exactly what I needed? I would have been there for a while trying to locate them. He literally saved me time out of my day at the expense of me saying in my head, what the F just happened? I'm still in disbelief. If anyone has a logical explanation, I'm all ears. So like decades ago, me and my family moved out to a different place for dad's work. It's a crowded concrete jungle city in a third world country. I was only 10 years old back then. The house was really old with one room on the top floor and two rooms on the bottom and then a really narrow hallway to the front door. I remember it very vividly seeing what seemed like a shadow-like figure. It was like when I moved my head from a different direction to another. I used to see what seemed like a really tall, dark, smoky, shadow-like figure, just talking towards me, and then it just used to disappear like nothing. I told my mom about it. She denied it was nothing, just mind, and I, I was just seeing things. Fast forward when we moved out of the house, I reminded my mom about it, and then she finally accepted. Yes, she exactly saw the same kind of tall shadow figures, and we matched the entire description of this figure, like we literally saw the same thing. She said I kept on denying it because I didn't want you to be scared. Not my account, but a retired Cajun corporal and reporter to me. I'm a paranormal encrypted investigator, by the way, about a possible Rougarou sighting that occurred on the back portion of his property just north outside of New Orleans on a spring evening back in 2018. The witness was sitting on his back porch, smoking his tobacco pipe when his eyes caught sight of some very large movements toward the back portion of his trees. It was dusk light enough to still see, but the sun was setting. 
He looked off into the trees and noticed what appeared to be a large hairy humanoid moving towards the tree line. He grew curious, wondering if this was some kind of bear. He grabbed a light and headed towards it. As he got closer, he noticed that the creature's head was much larger than a bear's. It resembled a wolf, but it still didn't answer what this creature was doing. He grew suspicious, and the witness claimed to sense something very strange. It was glancing around intelligently, looking directly in his direction, but it didn't act like the other animals do when they notice you. It did not appear to be frightened, which he thought was strange. The witness continued closing in on the creature, but did not get too close. The creature then began to walk towards the trees, but it never turned around or acknowledged the witness's presence. The witness did not want to let the creature get away, so he followed it into the trees. The witness claimed that even though it was dusk, it should have been light enough to still see, yet this man claimed he could not see anything distinguishable in the trees just by glancing around with his light. He was now growing very suspicious, but he decided to stay calm. He turned his attention back at the creature, noticing it was gone. He thought that maybe it had gotten away, so he went looking for a trail to see where this creature might have gone. The witness claimed that he found nothing. He didn't notice any droppings, tracks, or anything else that might indicate this thing's presence. The witness decided to look around the area some more, but nothing came up. He turned his attention back at home and went in. That would be when he discovered that his dog was missing. Come to think of it, he told me that his dog had been gone all afternoon. The dog had a usual routine of going potty at around 2 or 3 p.m., out in the back portion of woods to do their business and come back inside. He didn't think about it, and the dog was now gone. His mind immediately went to this large canine taking his dog without him knowing, which would explain its presence. It was potentially drawn to his dog as food, which is why he spotted it. It could have been coming back for more. He's not sure. He didn't hear any sounds of yelping or anything found no trace of blood or any signs that his dog had been taken or killed. But his dog after this was missing. He found it strange that when he cast light on this thing, it was so dark. He said that its fur seemed to absorb the light around it. It was unnaturally dark. He heavily believes that what he saw that evening was, in fact, a Rauguru. He has no doubts about that. He claimed that the experience was very memorable. He had heard about Raugarus and Raugaru sightings, but didn't believe it seriously until he experienced this for himself. My sighting of these giants happened back in 1996 when my unit was sent on a secret mission to the Hindu Kush mountains of Afghanistan. The purpose of our mission is irrelevant, but it has been declassified now, so I do have permission to tell you. We took off from Bagram Air Base just before dawn with another special ops team that were all Navy SEALs. They were flying on their own special ops chopper. Well, we flew in a Chinook helicopter supplied solely by the Army. We had to fly over some fairly high mountains to get into the valley that was our original destination. It was still dark at this time, so it wasn't until we got almost halfway through these mountains when I saw something strange ahead of us. There was a huge bright light flying through the air towards us. I couldn't tell if it was another chopper by the way it was flying. At least at this distance, no aircraft lights were visible, so I knew it wasn't one of ours either. Even stranger was that this object didn't have any sound coming from it. As it approached us and came closer, it was a dull gray color and looked very strange, as it seemed to glow almost. I remember being curious about what this could be. I did not have a radio on me, so I could not say anything to my co-pilot or the other chopper pilot. If this had been a movie, you'd probably think I should have gotten out a rifle and shot it from the sky. But for some strange reason, I just didn't feel scared. I believe it was one of the SEALs who finally yelled over the radio, asking us if we could see what this thing was. Right after he did so, both choppers came very close together. We were flying through a mountain pass. In that instant, I saw a giant humanoid figure down in a ravine in the mountains. Several of these figures, actually. There appeared to be about three of them. 
I'd say roughly 9 to 10 meters tall, red wild hair, and held primitive like makeshift spear weapons. I only got a few seconds to look, but I know what I saw. The seals were laughing all over the radio when we realized both choppers had almost come together. After that, I was terrified. My imagination ran wild thinking about these giants that had terrified me with their appearance. I have never imagined anything like that in my life to what I saw this day. I don't know what to think about it. I was later on instructed about what I saw to keep my mouth shut, so I did. The way my superiors instructed me to do so was, we simply don't talk about those things, period. And that was the end of that. The following true story about the Oregon wilderness was told to me by Jim, my aunt's friend, avid hiker and hunter, so I don't remember much of the details. His stories all had basically one particular conclusion presence of something intelligent in surrounding wilderness. Jim used to hike just like my grandpa with one little exception that my grandpa was a professional backpacker back in the USSR, which is going to be of some significance later, and he traveled with a group and some firearms. Jim used to go all alone in the wilderness with a firearm as well. Jim's encounters have never ended in a particular meeting with an entity, but usually in a form of traces, broken branches, distant howling and roaring, and a feeling that he was being watched which he actually dismissed as his natural instinctive reaction to unfamiliar environment and vast possibilities bears, wolves, moose all could be around except for one such encounter. I don't remember what area he was telling me exactly about, but I'm pretty sure it was one of those rogue river forests in Oregon. So as usual, he left his car at the parking lot and continued afoot. I think he planned for three days, but I'm not sure. Anyway, closer to the dusk, Jim found a place for him to stop. He prepared his dinner using a portable stove, got into his tent and sleeping bag. He then fell asleep. He couldn't recall when it happened, but it was already dark outside except for the moon shining over the nearby top, but Jim didn't know that yet. Jim woke up to loud banging noises that appeared to be wood on wood knocking, but it was so loud he couldn't hear his own commotion as he was pulling the sleeping bag forcing himself out of it, then pulling the rifle and sending a round into the chamber. He called out once, twice, thrice. At that point he was frightened. The banging never stopped. He poked his rifle out of the tent and squeezed the trigger. Flash illuminated the outside of the tent. The bang followed, and then silence. From what I remember, it was kind of a deafening silence for him. Blood was pulsing in his ears. He was blushing and almost had a vertigo. He also was startled by his own rifle as everything happened so quick. He never adapted to the situation. It was silent for not long, but for him, it was almost forever. Did I just kill someone? And then roaring and sound of breaking branches not far away. He was so scared and confused, he was contemplating whether he should stay inside and wait with a rifle or go outside and pursue the intruder. Jim forced himself out of the tent screaming, You mother F, leave me alone, I'll shoot you. There was nothing outside. His eyes just started to get used to the darkness, and within a minute he noticed that a spruce not so far away from him, maybe in a distance of a clear shot, started to swing from one side to another like if there was something on top of it forcing the tree to break down. It was like that for quite some time, and then it stopped. Jim decided to get inside and wait for sunrise, which he did, and then he quickly grabbed everything he had and made all the way back to the parking lot as fast as he could and never stopped for longer than enough to catch a breath. As for my grandpa, he was much younger at the time he was hiking and kayaking back to civilization with his group in the Urals. They spent weeks in wilderness occasionally encountering foresters' cabins or entire villages of the local population called Mansi. They would usually trade something for food, usually alcohol which was the most valuable product for Mansi and they would direct them not to go into certain areas deemed cursed or sacred. My grandpa never was a communist, a member of the Communist Party, 
which was a reason why he was never considered for promotion. He was a deputy director of aerodynamic lab at one of the Soviet's mechanical engineering centers busy with nautical ballistic missiles for submarines, but he sure was atheist. So they would only smirk and do whatever they want. And even then they would encounter some weird shit. I was amazed just how similar Jim's story was to one of my grandpa's stories. I was digging through my grandfather's things a while ago and came upon this report that I thought was very intriguing. This is a report from a soldier located in Falk, Arkansas. He had encountered what he can describe as the Boggy Creek Monster during a shift at night. This is his account. The date unknown, the report was given around 1930. At approximately 21 hours, our guard posted the usual two men. Shortly after I took over watch, I heard something off the path moving towards me that was large. Thinking it was my relief, I challenged him by name and ordered him to halt. But instead of stopping, this man broke into a run. I then took pursuit, firing several shots at him with my rifle in order for him to stop not directly at him, but around him. He apparently was not hit and disappeared into the darkness. I could hear something running away ahead of me for the time, but it soon ceased its noise. I did not see a man or dog, although it might have been a bear going through the underbrush. This would happen over the following nights, and the sentries would each time fire at it, but to no avail. We were never able to catch up with this man-like creature, but it was certainly not a bear but I cannot say what it is. Maybe some of the wild men from the hills. I know nothing more about this matter, except that I never hope to encounter it again. It sounds to me like this soldier had encountered the Boggy Creek Monster. My stepdad lived in Virginia when he was around the age of eight, right on the edge of the Great Dismal Swamp. According to him, he was in bed one night when the sky was cloudless, or just very bright. He never thought until recently whether the moon was shining, or not and saw a beast looking right through his window at him. He said, he could see spittle running down its face and its eyes were looking straight at him. It was supposedly standing on its hind legs and had cream, red and brown colored, matted fur and a face almost like a wolf. Other than its snout, its facial features were very human. Its jaw bones were high, the structure around its eyes, and its eyes themselves were human-esque. The coloring of its eyes, he believes, were yellow. The reason why I think this is interesting and possibly valid is because the Great Dismal Swamp covers a huge amount of territory and is hardly touched by humans. Only in recent years have people started to study its inhabitants. The grounds are wet, mossy, and absorb sound and people have been known to wander into it and never return. Who knows what could be lurking in the unknown? Chills my bones. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that he crawled out of his bed and went straight to his mother's room. In the morning when they looked around the house, all the windows had ground that was stirred up under them and grass that was yanked out. There were actual scratches in the wood under his window and paint was missing too. However, as far as they could see, there were no discernible footprints. One morning around 6 a.m., about two years ago, I was living not far from Washington, D.C. A friend of a friend needed a roommate to afford the rent for an apartment he had found. So when I was told about this, my first thought was, oh yeah, here's my chance to move out of my parents' house. After about six months of living in the area, I noticed that on certain nights, I would hear loud roars in the distance. I could never tell how far away the noise was coming from. It would sometimes sound nearby or just far enough away where I wouldn't mind being outside to see what it might be making the sound from a safe distance. I lived in a quiet, wooded area. A lot of people lived in the area. I actually lived within five minutes walking distance away from the University of Maryland. One morning around 6 a.m., I just snapped awake from a deep, sound sleep for no reason at all. I started to go back to sleep, but thought to myself, why am I wide awake and alert? It was strange. I was completely awake. 
Then, right in my backyard, I heard a low, deep growl. That's when I knew something was up. The moment I heard that, I knew. That was why I woke up. I remained quiet and didn't move for the next five to ten minutes, as this thing started to become very active in my backyard. It went from the low growls to heavy breathing. This thing's lungs had to be massive because it sounded the same exact way a horse would if you were standing right next to it. When it breathed through its nose, it sounded more like a horse, but this thing sounded like it was aggressive. I knew it wasn't a horse in the backyard. That wouldn't be possible, but what I saw was very real. It literally ran from my backyard into the dividing fence of my backyard, from my neighbor's backyard, again and again. It made no sense for it to be doing that. It would often stop and sniff around and sneeze very loudly. It sounded like it was right next to my window, and I was on the second floor. I didn't want to look out the window because I thought that there's no way in the world no one else is hearing this right now but me. I thought, this thing is trying to get my attention on purpose. I stayed still in bed, without moving, and I was beyond scared. I really thought it was a werewolf, even before I saw it. I always thought that they were real. The guys that lived below me started yelling and screaming, El Diablo, over and over again, they yelled that. I could hear the thing leaving the backyard, so I hurried to try and get a look at it. When I did, all I saw was its backside. This thing was massive, with broad shoulders like a bodybuilder, and it had ears sticking up on its head. It slowly walked away until I lost sight of it. On November 22nd, I was deer hunting with a friend on some state land in central New York. After we got settled in a spot to sit, we started hearing wood hitting wood, which sounds completely different from stepping on a branch that breaks and several whooping, grunting noises. Not long after that, we heard a large tree fall or push to the ground, and something was, stomping through the woods, breaking large branches. At first, we thought it was a bear because it was so loud like something big and heavy, or maybe a hunter, but we were the only ones there. Plus, hunters are trying to be quiet. All that noise brought us to our feet. While looking in that direction of the noise, I saw a tall, dark figure shaped like a pillar. There were no shoulders, so I'm thinking it was a side view. It was around noon. The pathway where the figure was standing was open and light up with daylight. I'm thinking it was about 50 yards away. I was staring at it for about five minutes trying to see what I was seeing. The top where a head would be was turning back and forth. The reason I know is cause there was something a dark red color that I kept seeing move around. And the darkness of the figure seemed to change like it was moving. I didn't want to take my eyes off of it. I was trying to reach in my bag to get my binoculars out without taking my eyes off of it. But I couldn't get into my bag. So I looked down for a second and when I looked up it was gone. After that we heard more wood hitting wood and the whooping grunting sounds. Both sounds were coming from two different directions. Then it stopped and we moved to a different location. My German Shepherd hunting dog and I went early to hunt this morning at 5.45 a.m. along the old abandoned railroad bridge that crosses the bayou close to my hometown of Crowley, Louisiana 75026 population 13452. As it was early, there was a humid fog, and it was dark enough to not see anything. We walked slowly between the rails of this old set of rusty railroad tracks. Hunterbone stopped and looked ahead down the rails as if he heard or sensed something. With nothing in view, we continued along, only for Hunterbone to stop abruptly once again. What is it, boy? A raccoon? A rabbit? Suddenly, a huge, hairy dog-like creature came out of the fog down the rails, standing on its hind legs upright. Oh shoot, I was terrified and fearful, and I raised my Remington 12 gauge to fire two rounds of buckshot over this wolf-like thing's head. Blam! Blam! The critter howled loudly and turned to run back up the rails across the old bridge, and I could hear it as it snapped shrubbery and foliage in the distance. Hunterbone and I ran back towards the pickup, and I turned about 50 yards to fire two more rounds for insurance so we would make it home. 
As we got in the truck, we hauled Boggy fast back to the main road that leads to Crowley La. As we pulled into an Exxon gas station, I saw a Louisiana state trooper and explained my ordeal to him. He said he has had hairy dog creatures run in front of his cruiser at night, and it disturbed him greatly, but that the thing always heads off into the woods or jumps off the road. Well, okay, I'm going home to chill out. Later, as I sat in my home, I tried to rationalize what the hell I just experienced and why. For one thing, after 25 years of bayou hunting, why the heck did I not ever hear of this creature? This experience will keep me from hunting alone in the future. It really rattled my chain for certain, and I suggest if you are going to hunt here in the south of Louisiana by yourself, be better prepared. Relatively recently here in Sweden, we had a bit of a whoopsie. A visiting hunter from Norway was for some reason best known to himself out at 4 a.m. He was using a thermal imaging night scope with a recording function. Thanks to that record function, he's now charged with attempted murder. He took aim at a 75-year-old man jogging and squeezed off a shot. 200 meters, 338 Lapua Magnum, with residential buildings as a backstop. The old man miraculously survived, but his hip was totally f -ed. Now this sack of Norwegians claims he was sure that this running biped was a roe deer. Okay, but they were out of season, and you're not allowed to shoot them in the middle of the night either. What does he do when his target goes down, picks up the rifle and runs, away from his victim? Most of us think he pulled the trigger by accident, Still a massive D-head for aiming at a non-target. So, what makes me worried when I go out hunting? There might be a dumbass Norwegian out there. Edit. Google Norwegian Hunter Shoots Swede and look for an article for The Local. The video this guy's scope recorded is there. Would you call it attempted murder? I'm not entirely sure myself. Still apologies to all the Norwegians I seem to have upset. Please don't shoot my granddad. Ocala National. You probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put those up to scare people away. Me and a friend were hunting there and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper in the woods than we planned on and began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods from the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with the R-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus the moon was bright enough to navigate by even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles and I had a large, powerful flashlight in NY hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. Whatever the point is, we were not paranoid of anything. We were heading back and we start to hear something hauling through the woods on our right, and it was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails or old logging roads are pretty wide, and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear, either way we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, then I turned on my light. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts, and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird. But again, unarmed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car, and I was relieved it was still there and not broken into or anything. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and center console, and get in the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala National. About half a mile down the road my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered, buttoned-down shirt and shorts just wallin' along the road. 
We are miles from any paved road, and then it's another 5-10 miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this in the northern part of the forest where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? WTF was he doing walking out here at 1.32 a.m. with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing. He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip and I can't wait to go back, but he'll always be armed in Ocala National. Some seriously weird shit goes on out there. I think I have a Sasquatch problem. So throughout the days we take our two dogs outside to their kennels so they can get out of the house for a while and run and play and such. These are not small dogs. One is a black lab husky mix and the other one is a full-blooded Staffordshire Terrier pit bull. The kennels are placed at the edge of the yard near the woods. These woods are big, large enough to take a day to go hiking through them. Lately, when it gets dark, the dogs seem on edge. They will bark and whine toward the house to come in. At first, I figured they just wanted to get back into the house, but now I'm thinking they're actually scared. Three nights ago, when I went to get them, it was already dark, but we have a security light, so it isn't pitch black or anything. I got to the front of the first kennel and noticed both dogs were being quiet. They always bark at me excitedly when I go to get them but they were dead silent. This weirded me out a little, but not to the point of being scared. I will admit that there was a certain uneasiness in the air though, something I can't explain, but it sort of felt electric like I was about to be shocked. The longer I was there, the more uneasy I felt. I started getting the first dog, the lab, out and heard a heavy snap in the woods near the kennels. I froze, the dogs froze, by this time I was so on edge that if someone had spoken I would have jumped, screamed, and possibly ran. The creepy feeling in the air just kept getting thicker. The lab had her bushy tail stuffed underneath her and was whining. This didn't make me feel any better. The pit bull was as far away from the woods as she could get, whimpering for me to come get her. I can only take one dog in at a time because they get too excited and will sometimes try to fight so I avoid that at all costs. I felt so bad leaving the pity there by herself, but I had to do it. As I walked away, she barked this high-pitched whining type of bark at me that I have never heard her do before. The lab couldn't get to the house quick enough. I went back for the other one and dreaded every step as her door is right at the base of the woods. I would have to turn my back to the woods to open her door and get her out. The air felt heavy and stale, with an unpleasant smell like a dead skunk as I approached the kennel. Another snap and I was about ready to run for it, but I didn't want to leave my dog, who had her head down defensively facing the woods. I could barely make it. To be honest, it felt like trying to walk through water. I was terrified by the time I reached the door. I heard heavy breathing behind me as I got my dog out. She was scared too, but started growling behind me. I was frozen in place. The breathing continued for a minute before I heard steps started coming toward us. We both took off at the same time. A terrifying scream came out of the base of the woods. I didn't dare look back, I just ran. My pity pulled me all the way back to the house. I got in, flipped off all the lights and stared out the window at the woods. I could see something moving slightly, but just out of the light. It moved back and forth for about five minutes, then disappeared. It took me forever to fall asleep that night because I was so scared that every little noise freaked me out. The next night I went to get the dogs earlier, right around dusk. I thought all was good until I was getting my pity out. A huge snapping sound like a tree branch had just been snapped in half rang out. It sounded pretty far away so I just hurriedly got my dog and started toward the house. A few steps away from the kennel, I heard something big start charging toward me from inside the woods. We ran again, and it appeared to follow for so long, then retreated back. Now, every night since then I hear sounds coming out of the woods like branches breaking and being thrown around, knocking on trees and roaring. 
I am absolutely terrified. I no longer even take my dogs down. I just take them for walks during the day and make sure we are all in before dusk. I don't know what to do. I'm thinking about buying a gun, but I'm not sure it will help. I was in a 24-hour shopping center car park, waiting for a friend who works there at around 10 p.m. Suddenly, a kid pops out of the window screen and starts tapping. I'm thinking, where the hell did he come from? And is he trying to rob me? Anyway, I roll the window down only partially and remember that my doors are locked, so I feel a little bit safer. I ask the kid, what do you want? Sir, I'm lost. Can you take me home? I ask where are your parents as it was late at night, and there was no one else visible on the same floor I was waiting on. This was starting to feel off. I'm lost and just want to go home, he replied. This was definitely weird. I looked at him again. Then I did a double take. OMG, his eyes were white. Not just white around the edges, but unending white through the entire eye. No iris and no pupil, just a solid wall of light. I really don't why, but I felt myself smiling slightly as I gazed at him. Then my thoughts began to collect again. It must have been about three seconds. Uh, sorry. No kid, I have to go, I immediately regretted replying. But you have to take me, the kid replied. I don't know how, but I could feel his voice more than hear it. His words began echoing in my mind longer than it should have. Uh, no kid, I have to go. I started panicking. The kid replied again, this time with something indescribable behind his voice. I'm lost and just want to go home. I don't know how, but at this point, it was as if someone had put the kid's voice on a loudspeaker. And as he spoke, I felt as though a booming was resonating from within the kid. The force of the kid's voice was so strong. I felt strongly sympathetic to the kid, almost like I was being forced to buy him. Anyway, with the last ounce of control I had left, I turned the car on and slammed on the accelerator. The kid immediately shouted out, no, take me with you. At this point, it was as though the kid's voice was a machine gun firing into me. I immediately sped to the nearest exit in a dreamlike state and drove into the night. My friend at this point could find his own way back to his house, which he did later. While driving and exiting from the car park, I could still feel his voice within me resonating at an amplified volume. The force of his voice, it was as if I had been picked up and violently shaken by the kid whose voice was so clear, and my unconscious was analyzing every nuance and inflection of what he had said like I was being forced to. There was so much force behind it. Anyway, after I got back to my apartment, I immediately tried to forget the whole thing. The next day I drive to work in the normal manner and my friend was there resentful that I had left, but we soon went back to good terms. I never did tell him or anyone else about the incident. The strangest thing did happen, however, on that same day. When I was driving back from work back to my apartment, there was a tremendous thunderstorm and I noticed flashes, although I didn't see it of lightning. When I was at my apartment building, I live in a complex, I open a huge metal door to get in, and it was soaking wet. There was a handprint on it. I only noticed when I looked down to pull on the handle at about the same height, a small child would place their hands. The handprint was white, and although the whole door was dripping with water, the handprint seemed to be made of recently dried paint. I touched it, looked up, and felt it in my hand just to make sure it was painted. It was. I looked down again. The handprint within the two-second span of me sampling it and looking up had gone from white to clear from the rain dripping on the door. I touched it again and felt it. It was painted, but now completely soaked with water and far more fluid than it was before indicating it was being soaked. I looked down again. It had vanished. I put my hand on where the paint had been, but it was nothing but a metal door behind it. For some reason, I looked behind me. Of course, there was no one there. I went inside and made my way up to my apartment and had an early night. I have not encountered any white-eyed kids since or any being of supernatural type for that matter. However, I now live a slightly more cautious life than before. I have become more religious now and now occasionally read the Bible when I didn't really believe in God before. Maybe I'll go to church.
I don't know. The fact is these creatures might actually exist and are waiting for the right opportunity to strike. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.